It's an image of the homeland that is framed looking backwards. Um, and beyond the coconut threshold, the Ghanaian coconut husk is sort of decomposed into one of its elements, the pith dust, a very potent and widespread agricultural substitute for, for soil. Um, and this is sort of a, a, a nod to the return um, that is both a technological, material, and psychological um, concept. So today I, I'd wanna talk about the research we've been doing um, over the last decade and the sort of design of material flows between these three sites, the land, the building, and the plate, which requires a much larger framing of value. Today's system of looking at value between three sites um, in terms of production and transformation of value is incredibly narrow. It really lies between the first lifetime of a material and it concentrates design in the earliest stages of that life. Um, and more important, we're looking at how the flows sort of interact with the building material life cycle. The building material life cycle is one of the most powerful life cycles on the planet, capable of drawing materials from further and further away. We know that um, 40% of all energy is consumed in, in the building sector. Um, and it's not just a matter of quantity, but the fact that we spend tons of our time in indoor environments. So it has a disproportionate impact on our health and well being. Um, and we know that the lifetime of these materials are actually decreasing in our built environment. Um, and so thinking about this broader framework, um, I've been interested in how we look at how value is extracted from our ecology, typically from the land. It's transformed through layer labor, the conditions of, conditions of which can range from slave, slavery um, to overpaid work and industrial production. Uh, value is accumulated um, in sort of a, a system where there's an owner, be it the private corporation or the state. It's used by a consumer um, and often produces infinite piles of waste at the end of this life cycle. Um, and so looking at this, um, particularly in the context that I've worked, we, saw, we see all forms of alienated value in terms of large swaths of land that is used year after year for monoculture crops nutrients that are never returned to the soil in appropriate timelines, labor that is underpaid or um, their conditions embody um, suffering in these working environments, be it in the rural or industrial context. Consumers like us who have no knowledge of what and who is, um, is affected by the products that we consume and no real way to participate in affecting positive change in the system. And lastly, this sort of generation of waste um, that's by and large bio incompatible um, chemically with, with the land, water, or air. So we produce tons of pollutants, materials that are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and so this idea of alienated values, this sort of top-down extraction of value that is alienated from its generation mechanisms is something that um, we identify. It's always the first step in the systems. Where do we find these alienated forms of value? And I've been very curious to understand how the architect, <clears throat> given that we've occupied this sort of position in orange in between owners and consumers in many senses, driving that extraction value, how we might be able to occupy the bottom half of this diagram, um, working with um, stakeholders and context where there's an opportunity to return value back to its production mechanisms. So I'd like to begin with the first project, which is very much based on an agricultural, large scale agricultural waste, the coconut husk. Um, this is sort of where it began, but it's a case study of a much larger system. We today produce 9.4 billion tons of agricultural waste or residues, um, a renewable resource. One could argue this is the world's most underutilized material resource stream. And we know that um, about 40% of this material is wasted in the sense that it is combusted in open air or it is um, downcycled prematurely. Um, and the rest of that makes its way in some form to our, to our table. We were looking at a whole range in the beginning of agricultural waste, but decided to go with the, the husk, the coconut husk, which is sort of in the middle of this um, inventory. Um, although it is not one of the big four, sugar, corn fiber, rice, or wheat, it did embody a really interesting composition. What it was made of was a high percentage of structural lignin, 
um, and a relatively low percentage of sugar, which gave us a ton of opportunities to explore its, its use from an insulation product to sort of medium density fiber boards, all the way to high density um, boards that could be used for roofing. And um, this also is timely, um, given the fact that coconut has experienced a, a boom, a super boom in the last two decades, um, fueled by its popularity in health uh, food, as well as cosmetic products. And we see this constantly over and over again happening in superfood industries, where we think this is a signal of some kind of economic boom about to happen, but it's actually hinting at the fact that there is an agricultural crisis happening somewhere else in the world. The underbelly of many of these superfood economies is the production of a ton of surplus. Um, in this case, the husk is an incredibly difficult material to sort of end up in a landfill. In fact, it's illegal in Ghana to throw this away in municipal waste collection systems because they're they're incredibly strong. They have such a high bulk density that they end up, um, you know, sort of compromising some of the machines that are used in landfills. So what begins as a land pollution problem uh, quickly becomes an air pollution problem as coconut traders who sell this product um, on the streets in Ghana have to find ways of um, burning it at night uh, in parts of the city where they're less likely to be caught. So these are unused plots of land in the city. Um, and so we were very interested in figuring out how we might be able to work with these coconut traders and really um, leverage um, their expertise in terms of the city and, and managing this resource that is at, in their hands um, and using it as a feedstock for uh, developing a whole range of building materials. Um, it also was an opportunity to link um, for certain types of entrepreneurs who are working in this space with other emerging um, startup companies around the world, in this case in upstate New York, that were looking at bioadhesives, other types of glues for these natural fibers. And so that opportunity to um, do research, which no startup in Ghana can afford given already what they're facing, um, with bioadhesive companies expands the market opportunities and um, resources for research and development. So we compared um, a, a range of, of binders um, as, as sort of um, the technology gluing the, the milled coconut husk. Um, one of the amazing things about the husk is when you break it up, it already has the fibers and this dust-like substance called a pith, which um, under relatively low temperatures and pressures, about half that of what we see in plywood industries, it melts to form a robust glue. Um, we also explored fungal mycelium, which is the vegetative of, of state of fungi, which is another bioadhesive, and soy protein that was produced from the soy industry also as a byproduct. Um, and we sort of, you know, developed a whole range of boards from things that are more similar to balsa, um, low density insulation, all the way to up to medium density fiber boards. Um, we did have a, a board that was as close to the strength of oak, um, but that we couldn't replicate because those coconuts that we had made them from were actually mature coconuts from a certain region in, in Ghana. And that was one of the most interesting things about this, that no coconut is ever created equal and quality control and standardization is, is really an art and a, a, a way of trying to figure out how to do this economically and still get products that perform in a standardized or predictable manner. So for every husk product or any byproduct that we work with, there is always a, a range of pathways, transformation pathways. Um, in this case, you know, pressing them achieves a ton of mechanical performance, um, allowing them to be fed to mycelium or decomposing them into sort of um, more lower density filtration media. Um, allows us to use them as really effective filtration media, um, capturing indoor air pollutants, or as desiccants, things that can absorb moisture at particular parts of the day when it is needed the most, uh, particularly in hot, humid climates. Um, we did a whole series of, of tests trying to understand how the processing of these materials might affect their performance uh, as a building material. I'll just go through this very quickly, um, but these are incredibly breathable materials. They have such a high surface area in their internal matrix. Um, when compared to um, 
uh, other sort of reconstituted products, wood reconstituted products. We see that um, at higher humidities, they're able to absorb much more moisture, making them extremely effective at moisture buffering applications. Um, moisture also moves quite slowly through these through these materials. Um, in comparison with wood products, we did find out that their thermal conductivity is extremely high. Um, and we thought this would be a problem, but actually when we actually started to integrate the moisture and hygric properties of these, of these materials, we realized they operate much like what we see in thatch, uh, green roof assemblies. So all of the moisture that is gained into that internal matrix during the late hours of the night, early hours of the morning, um, is sort of soaked into the board, almost like a soggy mat. And during the daytime, when it gets hot, all of that heat is um, absorbed by the moisture and evaporation happens. So not only is there a moisture buffering, but there's an opportunity for this phenomenon we call intrinsic evaporative cooling, um, both of which contribute to um, reducing cooling and humidity loads in, in the tropics. Um, we did a series of tests to also understand, you know, how we might be able to improve um, the me uh, mechanical as well as the acoustic performance of, of, the, of the board. Initially, a, a, full, a fully made board out of coconut husk constituents can be an incredibly heavy panel. And really, we decided to, across the section of this material, um, match materials, uh, agricultural waste, where they're, they're most effective. So on the outside, you'll kind of see the coconut husk and a soy protein binder on the inside and outside surfaces, very good at dealing with abrasion, strong, um, and keeps the panel quite light. And we substitute the core of the panel with corn-fed mycelium, which is great for absorption, both thermal and acoustic. And it's sort of pressed as sort of like a Kit Kat, if you like. And so this, this panel is very much a collaboration between a range of um, fungal, corn, um, coconut, soy protein binders um, in order to generate a, a, a cost-effective and a, quite a light panel uh, for the purposes of acoustic performance. Um, and so in this sort of going back to the value framework, um, as designers, we have the ability to sort of um, leap ahead in terms of providing upcycling, if you like, pathways relative to sort of um, um, sort of moving the materials into um, the agricultural sector prematurely as sort of fertilizers and soil media. And this multipl multiplication or generation of value can really be controlled in terms of the choice of products. Um, moving a panel from a, a, a flat sheet to an acoustic panel multiplies that value um, by a significant amount. It is also an opportunity to broaden the stakeholder system, bringing coconut traders, other types of green manufacturing companies, even owners um, into, the, into the mix and understanding what the different types of value that each bring. And this is where we're doing um, uh, quite a bit of research today, thinking about the cultural capital, the economic capital, the environmental capital that is um, brought to the table by different stakeholders. And through understanding that, um, particularly in sort of cooperative environments, um, we're able to figure out how to distribute value, um, profits that are generated from this um, increase in value to a wider range of stakeholders. One of the, there were, there were a lot of successes in the initial coconut research, but one of the failures I would say was the fact that um, there, this is very much a, a resource that is produced everywhere. It's incredibly distributed. And because we deem it as waste, we haven't found a use for them. They're typically of poor quality. And so those two factors mean that no matter what, they're gonna be more expensive to, to produce than other types of wood or reconstituted wood products. And it became an opportunity to rethink how we might produce differently. Um, and so for this reason, um, we started looking more closely at fungal mycelium as a technology to prototype these forms of, of distributed production. And a lot of the work is not necessarily so much about the design of these systems, but rather the design of the, the materials, sorry, but the design of the production systems. Um, fungi is, is such an incredible kingdom of life. 
Um, and it, I'm still learning a lot about them. Um, but they have been incredible in terms of facilitating our move historically from, from different habitats. And it is no surprise that they're also the way in which our materials can return more efficiently and effectively into the ground. And so using this technology um, uh, that has been developed by a number of companies um, today commercially, we sort of feed the agricultural produce that have tons of cellulose to a certain strain of fungi that is able to digest them in the course of five to six days, after which they're sort of dried out to prevent uh, any further growth. Um, a lot of this work has been done with sort of urban farms uh, across Europe and other parts of, of Ghana, where we have people that are already in possession of a, 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 a quite a high degree of agricultural waste. This first project in Liverpool with um, an urban farm called Squ uh, Squash Nutrition and in collaboration with the Royal Institute of British Architects was really an opportunity to think about the simple tools and infrastructures that we may not necessarily realize could be vital to a distributed manufacturing system. So grow trays and um, <laughs> plywood um, uh, uh, cutoffs that enable us to form lips for these panels. Um, the grow chamber is made from an asbestos uh, chamber that is well used in the in the building industry to prevent any type of air contamination coming into the, the gallery itself. Um, flour is something we use in our kitchens, but it's common additional nutrition that can be added to, to mycelium to activate the growth process. And we did this in quite a large, um, with a large group of uh, of cross-section through society from middle school, high school, urban farmers, um, who many of which are elderly um, and up, up until the uh, university age. So we had about over 200 participants growing. And initially our industrial partners, Ecovative, said, you're definitely going to get an infection when you do it this way. Uh, we didn't lose a single panel. And I think that's a testament to how resilient the strain is um, after years of development. And so all of the panels were grown in this sort of mycelium construction chamber in the middle of the gallery and was used um, after two weeks, two grow cycles to um, grow a tunnel right at the entrance. So Michael Tunnel is also, was also reassembled for the Grounds of Return exhibition as we see over here. We also sort of expanded, not just looking at agricultural waste, but um, other forms of lignocellulosic residues some of which are found in the food industry, as well as invasive species that proliferate a number of sites around our cities today. And this project um, really was born in terms of the ecosystem around Atelier Luma in France, a really unique setting where most of 40% of France's agricultural produce is produced in this region. And there's a lot of collaboration and links already between their food, agriculture um, sector. And so we ex expanded, um, you know, to sort of food waste, agricultural waste, invasive species, testing to characterize and understand what is the common denominator between some of these um, wastes. Is it the relative ratio of cellulose to lignin? What is that threshold? In order to understand seasonality, is there a possib possibility to substitute certain types of agricultural waste with another, given its seasonal availability and achieve the same mechanical performance? Um, we also wanted to activate experimentation um, and make this a very accessible technology. Anyone could do this at home or in their, their kitchen. Um, and so we worked with the community kitchen um, uh, in Quifoy, Dan La Cuisine. Um, and sort of there's a hierarchy of microcomposites here from the more well, more standardized one that formed the base panel in this wall and others that are made experimentally from um, outputs from their farm, their community garden, as well as the kitchen to grow a whole range of um, objects that come or are made from objects in their, in their restaurant that are essentially used as the molds. Um, we also try to experiment with growing different types of um, bricks using waste PVC pipes as sort of a cylindrical brick and try to understand how um, these materials might be able to assemble or scale, growing them um, or bringing them together on day five to grow right next to each other with a little bit of pressure actually causes pretty robust bonding between them. Um, and we were also interested in seeing how we might be able to grow this, um, you know, um, on site at scale. 
And so there are a number of, of different companies that have sort of emerged throughout the world. Um, Ecovative is licensed to a number of companies. And we see it's very interesting to think about the fact that there are some companies, mycelium manufacturing uh, material companies that are situated within food mushroom companies today, others that have developed their own eco-manufacturing setups um, all over Europe, um, as well as in parts of the United States. Um, so we were working with an, one of them to actually grow an entire pavilion in a forest in the Netherlands. We ran this, uh, an example of this in our studio at RPI with Gustavo Kremble, working with everyday objects like buckets. Um, we sort of were doing a ton of experiments to understand whether the limits in terms of thickness, um, how well does the, the, the mycelium grow in terms of height, what types of ventilation regimes does it need? And this was used to grow over the course of two weeks, a sort of dome in front of the green building at RPI. Um, we essentially flipped it, um, needed, realizing it also needed, um, you know, sort of connections between them using recycled wood and um, uh, just common electrical wire. We sort of notched and, and used these recyclable materials to transfer loads between some of the, the cylinders. And this was used to develop the inverse of that dome, a sort of hanging basket and a beach forest where a number of honey mushrooms grow. Um, you know, we've sort of gone through a number of ways of um, experimenting the degree of form control we have with the material. Typically, we'll sort of mill a certain type of mold, um, and the mycelium actually can grow to a high degree of accuracy. All of the CNC paths are actually show up in the material itself once grown. Um, this is used to vacuum form the sort of grow trays we've experimented with using. As you can imagine, it's a ton of plastic. We actually uh, have done experiments trying to use other types of plastics that are much more biodegradable. And it's always a trade-off between how long we want to keep using the, the trays over 500 cycles versus, you know, 10. And so there's always that trade-off. Um, and then the mycelium is sort of inoculated in those trays. Um, one can always grow in um, other types of um, mechanisms to attach the panels to any type of system. So here you just see plywood um, sort of um, uh, squares or rectangles that are grown into the panel. Um, and this idea of growing all the infrastructure into your, your mycelium composite is really key, which one cannot necessarily achieve as just as easily um, with other products. And this is sort of the panel grown for um, part of that exhibition in C33 as well. Lastly, we've been doing a ton of work around um, what I think is probably the biggest barrier to these materials, which is their social perception and how to um, sort of mine and understand what really um, is the issue around people's hesitation to use um, sort of natural or bio-based materials. These are deep, deep seated, um, you know, also given the fact that today we build with concrete, glass and steel, these are materials that are considered modern and, and quite uh, durable. Um, being able to design more aspirational um, uh, 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 meanings attached to these materials is part of it. And it's for this reason that I sort of took a year off last year and was working more closely with farmers and a, a close collaborator, a chef, um, who's also dealing with these same issues in the culinary industry around trying to build an appreciation for indigenous ingredients. And there's much similarities between what's going on in the building sector and what's happening on our plate, um, 80 to 90% of materials on a plate uh, the rice, the chicken, everything is imported. What is, is what is grown locally is only the onions and some of the micro vegetables. Um, and this is not too dissimilar in terms of what we're building with in Ghana, where a large majority of our walls have been replaced by concrete. Um, we have metal roofs that form less than a percent of the building materials mass, but contributes to about 80 to 90 percent of heat gain given its its climate and location. And so um, over the course of a few months in a residency um, with Ellen Atsui, the artist, we developed a sort of um, a dinner exhibition um, which told the story of rice and coconut, two of Ghana's most famous cash crops. <clears throat> 
And the idea was to rethink how we might uh, instill um, these ideas of value transformation, a connection back to the quality of the materials and the earth, and how to rethink the value of waste. And so that culminates, I'm not going to go through all the dishes, but it culminates in sort of a, a revalorization of the dessert, um, which is made from the waste products of the coconut industry. And so it begins with this um, uh, idea of being able to taste all of the ingredients that are part of the, the coconut forest. The coconut is a very generous tree enabling, um, and it's very spaced to enable a lot of sunlight to get to a whole range of crops that are grown below it. So everything from a goosey, um, which is a sort of vegetable that is found locally, <clears throat> we're drinking also water that has essentially been poured in a ceramic jug, which has been uh, sort of burnt. So the activated carbon from the biomass is lying in the interior of the ceramic mug. So in some ways, you're actually tasting the earth and the water and tasting a lot of the crops that um, are part of the coconut uh, multi-cropping system. Um, dessert um, is actually a remake of uh, a street food called Kofi Brokman. It's made out of plantain and groundnuts, has all the right degrees of nutrition, but is always thought of sort of the poor man's food. And that's quite similar to working with earth masonry. That's the poor man's building block. And so the idea was to revalorize this. And so the dish is actually called Kofi Richmond. Um, and it's sort of a, a plantain um, sort of uh, uh, main ingredient. Um, you can kind of see it on in the, in the corner. And the, the milk that is added, which completely transforms the meal itself is made out of activated coconut carbon infused into tiger nut milk. And so it completely changes this sort of carbohydrate-based dish um, into sort of a really luxurious dessert. Um, one of the most exciting and probably the, the longest aspect of the residency was thinking about how to bring back forms of indigenous rice. Um, those are, you know, sort of the only two domesticated rice species in the world are the African and the Asian rice. And Basically, 90% of all the rice we eat in West Africa is Asian. There hasn't been a lot of investment into the African rice. And these are not no longer grown at scale except in two cooperatives around the country. And so we sourced about 126 of these species from the seed bank in Norway and Svalberg. And so we've been uh, cultivating them um, over the course of a year now. Um, and these were actually grown um, and sort of were surrounding um, all of the dinner participants in the exhibition. Um, this is what we're giving to the cooperatives to scale up um, and developing a taste also because all of the ingredients that were typically eaten with this rice um, has also changed. And so beginning to cultivate a taste for the indigenous rice is also part of what we're working on continuously. We also brought the rice into a public garden. Um, this is probably a cross last remaining green space. Um, it's a park called Afo Sutherland Park in the center of the city. And we were able to get the corner of this park, which is very difficult to do, only because this is a part of the park that floods every year dur during rainy season. And so the idea was to actually develop a bioswale and integrate flood tolerant media like rice, African rice, there's certain varieties that are very good at dealing with flood uh, conditions. And so we brought this into the park and that's the, the local um, uh, 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 municipal uh, representative planting the first rice seeds. And so that harvest was done. Um, we're on the second harvest um, and anyone can come and take any of the vegetables, the sister crops that are associated with rice from okra um, to lemongrass um, are all actually surrounding this ecology. Um, and you can, one can come in and harvest as, as needed. So I know we're sort of running short on time and um, maybe if, if we have five more minutes, I just wanna talk through just one very quick last project, um, which has to do with um, the ongoing work we're doing around textile um, in association with the textile industry and the textile materials life cycle, um, because it comes back to sort of extending byproducts of new processes. Um, so there's a wonderful company in Ghana we've been working on with for over eight years now. And these are home-based enterprises run by women who make high quality batik textiles for export. 
Um, and one of the beautiful things of this growing um, uh, enterprise is that they've grown very quickly. Uh, used to be six women, now it's 600 distributed throughout the city or the country actually. And coming together also leads to issues around water pollution. So all of the dyes that are used for their wonderful dye recipes are actually contaminating nearby water streams where they have pooled together. And so one of the things we've started to do is uh, they approached Willow to figure out a low cost way of treating their water using some form of agricultural waste. Um, and so relative to what we use today, a lot of the aluminum and iron based uh, flocculants, which is stuff that we use in our swimming pools, um, there's a wonderful agricultural waste called Moringa press meal. It's a byproduct of Moringa tea industry. And it's an incredibly effective flocculant once developed. And so you can kind of see here what happens after su successful flocculation where all of the, the worst um, <laughs> dye recipes, the blue blacks sort of um, are able to clump together and settle at the bottom producing some sludge and relatively clean water. And so while the system is, is in, you know, incredible, in terms of being able to be affordable and to scale up. This is also the idea that one cannot just introduce the material technology, um, you know, just because it works. And one has to really think about the framework around how dying happens. And so working with global mamas themselves who were able to identify all of the issues around dying ergonomically, air quality, a lot of the dye fumes are inhaled, not just by, by mother, but also by child requires that we redesign the dyeing infrastructure um, for all sorts of reasons. And so they became co-designers of their new dyeing stations using materials and um, water tanks that are easily sourceable um, in their communities. Lastly, um, this has been developed into a fair trade zone built by a friend, Jürgen Stroemeyer, who's an architect um, now based in Accra. And for us, um, we're very interested in the byproducts of this new process, which is the sludge. And so now we're sort of experimenting with a range of earth block and rammed earth masonry, um, not shown here yet, but really thinking about, you know, um, what can we do with that product? And I'll end on a, a tone of complexity. Um, when this was scaled up in the fair train zone, we realized that, you know, this infinite pile of sludge made out of the synthetic dyes is really, it's not a solution. Uh, it's really the symptom of a, a terrible system that is using and uh, materials probably in large quantities in the wrong way. And so what we're trying to do is go back to the actual dyes themselves um, develop them under criteria that match their, their textile production and look at the effluents as well as the sludge from natural dyes in order to develop these new form of, of sort of earth masonry. So I'll end there today um, and really um, sort of open this up for, you know, what new roles um, can we imagine for designers in unalienating value? It might mean working with new types of clients it also means being able to advocate for, you know, social engagement in a way that um, we don't necessarily do today. And that opens a whole range of expertise and a way of working um, in the world today that is, you know, incredibly needed, given what we're facing. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll stop there and open it up to a discussion and questions. Can you hear me? Okay, super. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think we can now open up to some questions. Are there any questions from the audience to start? Should I kick us off? We have one. All right, let me see if I can do this. I'm going to turn myself off. Uh, hello, my name is Matthew Petrus. I'm a second year BR student. And I was very interested in you, how you reuse the waste materials themselves and brought them into the building cycle. 
how do you how do those materials that have now transformed into building material go back into the life cycle of agricultural production per se? It's like how do the do the um, coconut husk panels biodegrade themselves? You said they they're very durable. Yeah, that's such a great question. And in fact, I, you know, when we think of developing materials, degradability isn't a common architectural methodology that we also investigate. You know, we're definitely on, more on the fabrication and development side. And it's something that, you know, there's a trade off, as I sort of said before, the stronger and more durable you make your pro products, um, the more difficult they are to degrade or they're going to take a longer period of time. Um, I'll answer that in two ways. One is, I think there there's definitely a, a huge argument for taking those materials and instead of burning them, storing them in the build storing them in the building to delay that carbon emission. Often we see that um, you know once used as a food product, they hold a ton of water. Um, some of the most luscious food products require that these materials are young. So you think of young coconut water. The coconut husk um, at that age has a ton of water, which means you have um, much more work to do in terms of getting it to degrade um, or to even burn it. You have to evaporate all of that, that water. Um, but in terms of studying their biodegradable, biodegradability, that's only something we're doing now. Um, and there's a project um, that we've sort of gotten support for, you know, specifically focused around this idea of what types of materials make sense to bring together, given how they're grown um, agriculturally. So there's a question of scale and ratio and how do these materials decompose over time? And so what are the architectural tools and methodologies that need to be brought in at the same time as fabrication so that we understand how they degrade. Um, so that project is called Soil Sisters. And essentially we're working backwards, looking at indigenous forms of farming and soil cultivation um, in Ghana, as well as Guatemala to understand, you know, what is that multi-cropping ecology? How do we design with the byproducts of those crops and how do they degrade over time? Um, Obviously, there are certain types of binders like fungal mycelium. Again, not as strong, but much easier to degrade relative to something like the coconut pith, um, which is, you know, takes quite a lot of time relative to the fungal mycelium. So I don't have an answer for you. Perhaps in a year I will, um, as we continue doing some of those tests. Um, but again, I think that choice, um, understanding that criteria of biodegradability has to play into our binders, you know. Um, so, yeah, not a direct answer yet, but it, we're still on that journey trying to understand it. Hello, uh, my name is Shibna. Uh, I'm here uh, as a uh, visiting professor from Turkey too. Thank you for this uh, really very inspiring uh, lecture and the presentation. What I'm kind of curious about is uh, about the you know the intermediary processes while transferring such you know uh, materials that are kind of uh, you know, residues or kind of uh, other trash material. Turning, it, turning them into some certain build, building materials. About the process, about the energy that is being perhaps still used or consumed or the technique and the technology is still applied. So when we just compare it as kind of pros and cons, so how you evaluate that is the kind of the question I have. Thank you. Yeah. This is something that, you know, from the beginning, um, when I first um, understood how micro manufacturing happened. Um, I realized that, you know, while the flag of bio-based is flying high, if you actually look at the infrastructure that is used to extract, transport the raw materials, all of the quality control and all of the growing infrastructure, there is a huge problem. 
um, number one, all around the world, but maybe in, you know, certain mature agricultural industries, like what we see in the Netherlands, no one knows how to treat their waste properly um, in terms of sterilizing them and sort of processing them to a standard size. And so while we have a fledging hemp industry in upstate New York, um, companies like Ecovative were importing the hemp from the Netherlands because it was too costly to then take the burden of treating the waste on their own. So you can imagine the, the carbon footprint of shipping um, hemp across you know, the ocean. And then you know, there's, there's always this tension, I think, between the material infrastructure and, and materials themselves that are used to grow um, you know, we obviously have to have materials like plastics that are capable of being sterilized so we don't contaminate materials or technologies that need growing, whether it's algae to fungi. Um, and so there can be a ton of plastic waste that is generated if we don't think how reuse in the design of our own material growing infrastructure is designed. So, you know, our grow trays, we make them as strong as possible so that we can reuse them a ton. It's melted again if there's another form. Um, we no longer grow with what you kind of see um, in DIY kits where you have ceram wrap um, uh, around your grow tray. We have stackable um, plastic trays that, you know, are used um, over and over and over again. Gloves, I mean, you know, you look at the lab infrastructure um, and this is beyond micro manufacturing, it's just scientific infrastructure and the amount of uh, plastic waste generated by PPE equipment, is, it's, it's, it's quite an insane. And so being able to reuse bedding, uh, longer life uh, materials, supplies and, and equipment is, is what we've sort to, started to do in our lab. And that's kind of the way we're sort of working. Um, but apart from that, you know, I think a lot of innovation has to happen in the strain. It's kind of to, insane to think that there's only sort of one strain that is being licensed and commercialized uh, at scale. And we have millions of strains around the world, only 8% we know of. And this strain in particular requires refrigeration. It requires a high degree of sterilization. Um, and we know that there are strains found in the forest that hardly get infected. And so there's a need to, to really experiment with these strains that are resilient. Taking a strain from upstate New York and using it in a hot, humid climate, you will have a ton of mold because that strain is not conditioned you know, in, in that sort of environment. So it shows up in the life of the building material. So you know, we've been working with uh, CSIR Forestry, which is our national labs in Ghana, to look at a local strain um, and also match it to the type of food that it you know, prefers in order to get um, sort of building product that makes sense for that context. So that question is you know, really well uh, received and placed. Um, and I think it's something that we have to be incredibly cautious about in you know, sort of bio-based um, industries that our sort of carbon footprint doesn't exceed the conventional um, you know, in the quest of finding a more sustainable glue, we're actually generating a ton of CO2 emissions in the path to getting there. So it's it's incredibly challenging, but I think there's there's a lot of ways that people are beginning to address this with with a lot of um, investment and resources. Yeah. Sorry, did that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello, Mailing. This is Benai Gursoy. Actually, we met last year, so it's great to see you again. We met in the Biomaterial Building Expo at UVA. And then I wish we also invited Mailing um, in, when was it, May, when we were organizing at Penn State the Fungal Biomaterials and Biofabrication uh, Workshop slash Symposium. But uh, she, you were at Ghana, I believe. And yeah, so, so sorry to have missed it. Yeah, I wish you could have attended that one too. So it, it's, um, thank you for this amazing presentation and for super inspiring work. I had a question about the use of like the plastic formworks and how um, like you are planning or you have thought about eliminating plastic in shaping mycelium because that's also something we're thinking here in our research. We tried 
um, like paper-based formworks that are recyclable. We had some success with that. And right now, together with Felicia Davis, who is sitting next to me, <laughs> we're also exploring the use of knitted textiles made of organic yarns as a means to shape mycelium, but also, so it, it is actually working both ways, like to form mycelium, but also give the knitted textile some strength. So do you also think of, diff and, we're, and with a student of mine, we're, think we're exploring how we can 3D print or ways of developing recipes, and there's exemplars of 3D printing mycelium to completely eliminate formwork waste or need of formwork. So that was um, that's one of my questions. Like, do you also think of ways of making the process more sustainable without, like, w by eliminating also these kinds of by wastes? Because like the good thing about mycelium is you can grow it on waste, and then it's biodegradable. It doesn't leave waste. But as you do that, there's still waste that can be generated. Yeah. 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 This. Thank you so much. And a big fan of both your work. Um, I honestly, this has been something that's weighed heavy on my mind um, for for a while. And I think there's two two things um, that to me are long term goals. How to get there? Um, you know, we're we're definitely taking steps towards, but. One is sort of having spent a lot of time this year with, um, you know, forestry researchers and um, understanding that there is no way we, <laughs> by focusing on one strain, can we develop an entire sort of material infrastructure um, around that. There's there's so many other ways to get around infection. Um, uh, the the time of of that is needed to grow, if we start looking at what does well already, you know, out there, and so you know, one of one of the strains that um, you know we sort of were looking at is sort of a strain that grows on a very specific a part of the palm tree um, sort of head. Um, it grows um, without any infection, no matter what is around it. Um, and trying to understand things like that already, you know, in nature, in, in a forest environment where there are tons of opportunities for infection, I think to me is the most inspiring thing. Um, so th that's sort of strain dependent. How do we start a, to really democratize and, and, and develop our knowledge of the fungi kingdom? Um, the second, because, I, because plastic has a lot to do with preventing that infection, right? Um, the second one is is really around. Um, I don't think you know, formwork is bad. That's a personal opinion. I think our use of it um, and really extending its lifetime, um, or being able to recycle it, you know, like the plastic grow trays, melt them, form a sheet, grow again. I think for me is um, sort of a, a near term to midterm strategy. It's kind of like for me some of the components, structural components in our buildings, like steel um, uh, that that we want to reuse over time, they're not bad. We just need to minimize their use and extend their lifetimes. Um, and I think right now we're nowhere close to doing that. We just think there's an infinite amount. Anytime we need a new mold, we shape, we, we vacuum form and we use when we can actually really economize and extend the lifetime of these materials. Um, so that's sort of the near to midterm strategy. And then the other is sort of, you know, exploring the strains. But um, I, I really admire what you're doing with the sort of um, fabric substrates. Um, I'm very interested in the idea of inflatables, um, if they particularly could be associated with that textile um, uh, substrate itself. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm... I would love to discuss this further with you because it's not something we've been able to to solve as of yet. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, there's a number of sort of um, coatings, bio-based coatings, which can be sprayed on to, you know, some of the formwork that we use. Obviously, they require a respray after so and so cycles. But for me, um, that's sort of an interesting barrier, um, a thin barrier that is you know, something one does every time that they they make that requires or aids with recycling the formwork and not using plastic in that case. 
That is also, you know, something I'm, I'm quite interested in, but unfortunately they're quite expensive still today, right? Um, but yeah, I don't know. Really, really looking forward to maybe making some headway with with that aspect of, you know, micro manufacturing for sure. It's it's a huge issue. And I don't think we're taking stock of that enough. If you know of any CO2 emissions or LCA studies around micro manufacturing, please let me know. Otherwise, I think we ought to be doing this. There's actually one published this summer, a couple of months ago. And oh, wow. I'll, I'll send you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have tons of questions, but I can leave the others. Maybe another question, but I think the idea of, like, there's so many different fungi species and strains available, and they have different properties that they have, they can do different things. So one, and one, that was one of the things that we discussed also in the symposium with some, you know, mycologists. Uh, the idea of maybe creating some heterogeneous cultures where we don't only have one type of fungi, but there's actually an ecosystem like in like in the nature, because you know the, the fungi can grow in nature without contamination or what we see as a threat, like the like trico like the green mold contamination in nature. It's not really a threat because they help each other. So one thing that we also discussed and we're still thinking about is maybe this kind of this way of creating like biomaterials through ecological princi principles and not like with a where we you like sterilize everything and inoculate with one fungi species but anyways i think this is um yeah. to, to hear that from you too and uh, amazing work again yeah no i, I find that very um compelling and there's a lot of synergy with the way we're thinking about micro micro processes in the growing as well as you know how what are those properties w once they inhabit the real world or our world <laughs> their world is real too um you know i think a lot of some of the biggest barriers to scaling up micro products um some, I mean, obviously these materials can be incredibly um, beautiful visually, depending on the way we, we make them. Um, but there are also, as you said, certain phenomena that can happen, mold growth, um, which also begins to change the way they smell, um, which is an even more, um, uh, I guess, it penetrates our senses even more than, than looks. Um, and I think, again, I think that's a whole... Uh, territory or frontier for thinking about, you know, material performance. Smell to me has been this huge barrier, right? Um, I don't know if you heard the, I don't know how true this is, but um, BMW almost replaced all of their car insulation with mycelium, myco insulation. And at the end of the day, didn't because of smell. No one likes, well, everyone likes the smell of the new car. Those VOCs just... We, we can't get enough luxurious affiliations with that smell, right? We have air fresheners to, to mimic it. And mycelium doesn't quite smell the same way, right? Um, and so in Luma, we were looking at a strain, for example, that is very selective. It only eats beet skin, sort of a bougie fungi, <laughs> but it produces vanilla, the actual vanilla compound. Um, and mycelium is a ton of vanilla is actually made that way today. Um, again, but do we want to be smelling vanilla 24 seven? Probably not. Um, so it makes me think, you know, how do we begin to design for all of these really complex, um, you know, senses, essentially um, experiences of, of these materials. Um, texture, I think is something that is so underplayed because, you know, it's one of those, um, material properties that might be able to increase value over time. You know, I think of um, leather and and you wear in leather, like a, a horse saddle or a jacket or a leather shoe or a blanket, you know, it's kind of hard and, you know, uh, whatnot and when you first buy it, but as you use it over time and it gets softer and all that kind of stuff, it it becomes the most precious thing in your living room. But all of those types of, of performances that I think are quite unique and, and things that we can actually 
begin to build into some of these bio-based materials might be the very things that transform their value relative to the conventional. And it's not an easy thing to design, you know, towards. So <laughs> I think um, it's probably the realm that might be able to transform, um, you know, their social acceptance relative to the inert VOC off-gassing materials that we have today. Hello. I guess I have some problems with technology. Um, thank you very much for this really wonderful talk, Milling. Um, I really appreciated the um, how the work that you do in the lab is also um, thought to go out of the lab in the hands of people who um, are probably in need and you consider the whole social aspect of the material. I think this is really um, something that is um, missing in a lot of the work that uh, around, I think, materials. I think that's really something that I very much appreciate um, what you're bringing to the conversation. It also brings me to uh, this other aspect. Um, you, you talk about it not necessarily in a, a direct way, but I feel that it is you. You're bringing an idea, a very philosophical idea about like material building material, and you know the fact that it it is maybe going to be recycled. It will going to res uh, to go back to you know dust. It is going to ch uh, it it is is a way of building that we have forgotten. And uh, for simple reason that our values have changed and we're probably a little bit more materialistic and we are di completely disconnected from, you know, the earth and what we, uh, what, what we are. Not that I, I, I want to be a hippie and, uh, <laughs> you know, live in uh, uh, a, 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 <coughs> a house that falls apart, but I, I, I believe there is something to bring about you know, uh, this relationship that we have with our building environment. And I think it's some, I mean, I don't know, maybe you have thought about it, but I, that was part of my question. Have you thought about it? I think it's really interesting to completely participate in shifting our relationship to our build environment. So. Yeah, no, that's, it's, uh, it's a great remark. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh I missed that. She was saying it's it's partly question, partly remark, but it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. No, I it is um, something I've I've been thinking about because um, I think there's a relationship to our thermal uh, comfort and our thermal a perception of control. Um, you know, just given the trajectory of how um, thermal comfort has developed you know, in the history of our, of our discipline, um, and what that meant in terms of the materials that participated in it. Um, you know, you, you can't separate them. And so it's, it's something I've, I've been trying to write and, and, and think about more closely, um, because there is something to be said for our complete intolerance now for situations of discomfort, um, you know, when you when you press that remote control um, or whatever is on your wall to control temperature, you you get air at a very specific temperature in a very quick period of time, and that's so different from the way you know sort of bio based uh, materials condition you know our 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 indoor spaces. There's there's a time lag, and your expectations are definitely adjusted because of, you know, what you experience of the little of the outdoor environment. And so, you know, I, I think this is where design plays such an integral role. Um, and, and looking at how one is able to develop a gradient. So there isn't that sort of flattening, that two-dimensional flattening of the material envelope to a pane of glass or, or one wall but rather a series of spaces, transient spaces that, you know, build that gradient, you know, from the outside to the embryo of the home, which, 
you know, I think we, we've lost a lot of that dynamism. It's It cannot be collapsed into a material that's too much to ask, but rather it's sort of a three-dimensional, um, you know, shaping that also has to happen with these materials. And, and often we see, you know, mold growth or, you know, these types of damages happening to bio-based materials simply because we do not design to, to let them breathe, you know. We're keep, keeping them in very closed environments where humidity may spike for a very long period of time. And if they can't dry out, other other lives come into, into play. So um, I, I think this, this is a, a fully, um, you know, ripe environment or frontier for, for design, architectural design specifically, to, to really um, expand our, you know, our thresholds for comfort. And even make that in some ways, as sort of Lisha Song has said, you know, opportunities for thermal delight. Um, because, you know, God knows we're 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 getting worse and worse at tolerating and adapting. And we're gonna need to do much more of that given what we're seeing with temperature rise and and extreme climate events. Mayling, I want to abuse my power and ask one last final question very quickly. Uh it's a little bit light but it's still a serious question which is um why are you so transgressive <laughs> and, and, you know you present architecture in a very extremely architectural sense of how do we actually build them you know what are the what's the stuff that we use to make them but you do that in direct conversation with things like fashion and producing dyes for you know coloring fabrics, um, doing it in conversation with cuisine, with gastronomy, with thinking about agriculture down to, you know, the profile of the individual plants that live in the soil. And I'm actually kind of curious, like, where does that come from? I mean, where, where is this way of thinking about uh, building as a kind of part of a very integrative kind of spectrum of, of making and design? Um, yeah, I'm just curious, what's the sort of origin story of that as a kind of paradigm and process? Wow, I've never been asked that question before. And uh, I was worried because DK asks hard questions. Um, um, I, I think the answer is twofold. One is um, I come to architecture as an outsider. I, I did not, you know, go straight into a BR program. And perhaps that stays with me till now. Um, where there is this sort of need to come back to the architectural form, you know, to justify my place within architectural research. That's a personal note, but it also, I've realized over time has been a way to crystallize um, my understanding of, of performance, material performance um, in a way that is familiar where, where I can actually make and, and um, evaluate. So um, the other is I, haven't been able to find the tools or vocabulary and architecture to explore all of these other, um, you know, um, questions and criteria. Like, for example, the question around taste and understanding, you know, which materials make sense to bring into a product. You know, after working with Celestia Tarika, who's one of Africa's top chefs, I mean, their understanding of ingredients and what comes together intuitively is so sophisticated in terms of chemical composition and 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 flavors and all that stuff. And I think that broadens our tool set in in a way that is incredibly liberating and experimental. Um, maybe because food is cooked much faster, but um, I think sort of gravitating towards you know an expanded tool set. Um, is a way to 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 find our own vocabulary and tools. Um, not to say I, I stay there, but you know I do think that in everything that we're we're doing in terms of research, whether it's material characterization or you know understanding hydrothermal performance, we're always looking to other disciplines, you know, for these um, protocols. And I'm very interested in trying to understand what is the architectural protocol for testing you know what does an architectural protocol look like for understanding biodegradability or understanding water transmission um, doesn't have to be with a high-tech piece of equipment there might be something that makes sense at the architectural scale and 
I'm very interested in, in seeing that develop so that, you know, we might be able to incubate a very um, productive research infrastructure, you know, in, in our discipline. So um, I think going to other disciplines and coming back has been a very pr- fruitful exercise. Um, I don't know if it's the way, but it is sort of a one that I've truly enjoyed and probably will continue to. So <laughs> hopefully that answers your question, DK. It does. Thank you so much. We know how uh, insanely busy you are. So thank you for taking this time to tunnel through the wormhole and, and speak with us tonight. Um, like I said, you're live here in the building. So feel free to hop right off after this. But thank you so much from all of us. And thank you so much. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the invitation, DK. Good night. Good night.